exciting. Appreciate it. You are in the roundtable track in the panel discussion, the last presentation of the day. And we've seen in this track a lot of good talks um, from roundtable members, um, internal consulting organizations. The first six presentations were internal consulting organizations. The last two presentations were from big, big consultants, uh, Accenture and Booz Allen. And now on the panel, we're taking a little bit of a different tact, and we'd like it to be interactive if possible. Um, and, and you can ask your questions. We've got two smaller consulting firms, and then um, the Mayo Clinic. So I'm Kathy Lang, and I am from SAS, and I lead our business analytics practice within SAS, and I am the president-elect of the Informs Roundtable. Our panelists, starting from my left, are Mark Hayward, and he is the administrator of uh, the Center for Science and Healthcare Delivery at the Mayo Clinic, and he's also the Vice Chair of the Department of Facilities and Support Services. Welcome, Mark. Next, we have Chris Fry, who is Managing Director of Strategic Management Solutions. Chris is man uh, the management consulting um, and software firm specializing in uh, strategic business analytics helps businesses leverage the power of analytics and management sciences to improve strategic decisions in the area of pricing, supply chain strategy, forecasting and planning, uh, product complexity management, and operations. Uh, Chris has 20 years of consulting experience in business strategy and analytics. Welcome. And last but not least, Mitchell Berman. He's the founding partner of Analytics Operations Engineering is also a consulting company that he founded in 1994, and that company provides strategic directions to companies. Um, Mitch himself has worked specifically in the design and control of manufacturing systems, and has extensive experience in business modeling quantitative analysis. And I will let you guys further introduce yourselves as we go along. So let's start off with um, kind of describing your organization, uh, the kinds of people that are on your staff, um, and the kinds of decisions you support within your organization. Start with you, Mark. Okay, um, thanks, Kathy. So um, I work for Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic is a large, uh, non-for-profit non uh, healthcare system based in Rochester, Minnesota, with large uh, sites in Jacksonville, Florida, and Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we, uh, I oversee two different groups. One is this new Center for the Science of Healthcare Delivery. And within that program or that center, we have uh, a health systems engineering program that hires operations research, mainly PhD prepared uh, folks who sit within that program and work across and projects across Mayo Clinic. Um, we have others in that team like epidemiologists and healthcare economists and a wide range of folks in that, statisticians, uh, human factors folks. So it's a group of about 100 people within the Center for the Science of Healthcare Delivery that works on many projects across Mayo Clinic to improve care. The other group that I oversee is an internal consulting group of about another 100 people that have MBAs, MHAs, MPHs, uh, MSIEs, mainly master's prepared folks who come in and do internal consulting work for Mayo Clinic on a wide range of strategic projects and activities. So those are kind of the two groups I work with closely. We have other analytic groups around the institution. As an institution, about 60,000 people, um, about nine to $10 billion in revenue. Uh, so my team is uh, comprised entirely of people with uh, an OR or management science type of background. Um, some of them have different skill sets. Uh, some may be more focused on uh, data and computer science skills, some are more modeling or have specific experience in a domain that we do work in like supply chain optimization and pricing. Um, we have people ranging from bachelor's degrees all the way uh, up to master's and PhDs. Uh, so I you know, really try to mix it up a little bit um, with the different folks on the team. I also use a lot of contractors. Uh, we have a small team which sometimes I need specific expertise. Uh, for example, I have a, a very good database program So to, to try to distinguish us from probably the hundred other companies that you've heard that do similar things or have similar groups, I um, have the fortune of being a, an analytics company that actually was founded 20 years ago before it was ever very popular. 
our uh, hashtag line is PhDs with personalities from MIT. But um, rather than describe that, which is probably very similar to what a lot of you come from or are part of, um, I might talk about what's a little bit different about what we're doing these days that we're finding is sort of the next generation of where we're going with that group. Um, one thing is, uh, in response to what I think is the challenge that every firm is having is how do you really bring on the top level of talent? And so um, we're becoming what we consider to be more of an educational institution or organization and not just outside and running uh, educational programs, but literally taking undergraduates in now, which we never thought could do the work, training them, literally putting them through the training in what you might get in MIT education and then hopefully spitting them out into graduate programs and getting them back. So. Um, we're quite proud that um, we are getting almost all of our undergraduates into programs like MIT and Stanford, which is one of the uh, directions we're going now, which is probably not of much interest to the people in this room, but um, kind of gives you a feel for where we're going. And then the second thing is uh, the productization of a lot of the technologies that we've um, been using over the last 20 years. We're beginning to see, not that we, we never want to get into the shrink wrap business, um, but so many technologies get developed when you take on new things. I mean, I just remember listening to you about the things Kroger is doing with like things in the, in the parking lot. You, you take ideas like that, you find out there's a lot of other people who want to be doing the same sort of analysis. And so um, we never want to be in that software business, but we're looking now to shed those technologies. So the combination of sort of similar stuff to what you hear everybody else is doing, but with a new emphasis on education and um, commercialization of, of IP. So we've, we've heard a lot in these uh, discussions today and, and really throughout the conference of great successes with analytics and, and doing, um, you know, solving these great business problems. So what we're trying to do today is talk a little bit more about the issues, the challenges, and, and we'd like your insight and your comments and your questions as we go along. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand and I'll run back with the mic so that these guys can answer. Um, in the lots of surveys that we've seen coming up lately, there's two big issues and challenges that have come up. Uh, one being data is still the biggest issue to doing good analytics. Getting data, having confidence in the data, having access to the data, believing the data, believing the results of the analysis of data. So I'll ask the panelists to talk about that. And the other is analytical talent and where do they find it, how do you get it, what are you doing to expand your talent because we all have seen the, the surveys about the lack of analytical talent being available compared to the demand for talent that's happening in the marketplace. So I'll ask maybe Chris to start on the data side. Sure. So I, I actually disagree with that statement. I, I, I don't think data is the big challenge. I, I think. Hey, we're already getting. <laughs> 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 for me, I, mean, I, I think that you know, even as we're getting more and more data, and it's certainly exploding, right? There's all this data coming in, but it's not solving the problem. You're in an analytical field, your role is to make decisions under uncertainty, which means even though you may have some data, it doesn't tell you the answer, it doesn't tell you the whole story. And so I think that's really the skill gap that you know, can easily be forgotten as, you, as the field moves in its journey toward you know, big data and um, you know, lots, of, lots of information driving analytics. It's, it's really about uh, making decisions under uncertainty and having the right looking at the right problems, which you know, we, we may not know what the future looks like, but we have to make a decision anyway. So I think that's the question. Does, does that mean the lack of data? It's not the abundance of data, it's the scarcity of data in, in that case, that you don't have the right data to solve the problem that you're trying to, is that? Yeah, and I wouldn't even take it a step further and say, I, I don't even think you, a lot of problems that are important to business are not problems that data is gonna answer the, the data's gonna solve the problem. to have a crystal ball to see what the future looks like, but in a lot of cases you, you don't have that and, and so you're making a decision where even though you don't have data to drive it, you have to use information, you have to use knowledge, and maybe you have to think strategically about what the options are. That's Anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean I can comment from a healthcare perspective. It's really a time of kind of unprecedented growth in data available in healthcare. Um, and, and that's a really good thing in that we have more and more data to use to do analysis and to do our analytics with and I think to, to look into issues and problems in healthcare. So whether it's genomics data, you know, and, and gene data, which is unleashing, you know, an, an 
opening many new avenues of analytics um, to match treatment to specific gene, uh, your specific gene makeup is really exciting work. Um, but, but there are other challenges with that as far as EMR data. Um, the standards haven't been there for the EMRs, and so you, you know to bring data together from different EMRs, we've got you know, when I when, uh, five years ago we had six different EMRs that we merged systems, you know, at the Mayo Clinic, <laughs> we had different providers, and even within a, one provider we had different instances of EMRs that had defined things differently. So we went through one exercise. We looked at how blood pressure was collected, and there were 87 different ways that a blood pressure could be collected. We're like. You know, how do we use that and how do we bring that together to, to draw meaning from that data around blood pressure? So we have a lot of work to do within healthcare on standardization, bring that data together, at least a lot of work to make sure we have good data that's validated that people trust and can use. Um, so there's really a two-edged sword here and it's so much more data. And I agree, the data can't always be perfect, so we have to use what we can and still you know, you do our best to drive insights um, from the data that we do have. Uh, Jeff Winter from EPS. Um, we have a huge data repository that covers six, the last 65 weeks of our uh, delivery and pickup data. And just in the last six months, um, I was stunned because I was in a meeting where this data repository representative started saying, you need to justify saving new data. You need to tell us why it's valuable and how you're going to use it because we're not just going to keep saving data for the purpose of saving data unless there's other use behind it because we're running out of space to put it in. So I thought that was interesting. In retrospect, I decided like y'all can put on there. So I, I think um, when I when I heard your question, I think of the data issue in four different parts, and I think depending on which part of it you're talking about, there are good and bad answers. It actually relates to the point you made. The first is, does the data exist, and is it in clean form? I think the answer to that is absolutely better than it's ever been. It's there. It's being collected to the point where. So much is being collected now that you are getting restrictions on it. There's not enough resources to pull it out, and people don't even know how to get to it. So we just got an assignment from an extraordinarily large retailer where everything we needed was there, but nobody knew how to get to it. I mean, it was it has literally been the challenge has been actually just getting to it. So it used to be the problem that it wasn't there, and so you'd be you know you'll take everything you can get. The second problem becomes now how do you even there is so much of it that what do you do with it? So I think the question, I think what your what your firm is doing is actually good, which is, are we even gathering the right stuff anymore? Because now it's like you know someone walks in with you know their right foot first. Let's gather that piece of information, and you know it's across the board. It's like you know what do you really want to use? The third piece of it though is, okay, so you've got the data, you've got it clean. Now what do you do with it? And I'll give you a very, very simple example in forecasting. We were, we were doing spare parts forecasting for a company, and they had a distribution of demand. And for three years, they had been trying to figure out what distribution it was until someone actually went out the field and realized that they get demand. This was spare parts for lo uh, locomotives. That one set of customers were just buying spare parts for the U.S. domestic railroads. The other was the government of South Africa, all of a sudden the government released $10 million of spare parts and they would come in and they would literally go down the shelves and take every single brake pad they ever could. Now, if you didn't understand that the demand streams were coming from different locations, right, you can't tease that apart. But it does, that's not a mathematical or a data issue, but to use the data requires insight. So I think that's the third thing, and that's where there's a tremendous shortage, being able to use insights and techniques. And then the fourth is, once you have the insights, I still think there is a dearth for a of people who trust it, understand it, or can execute it. So I think to your point, the availability of the data is there. There is I, at least ninety percent of the clients we walk into now, they have the data, and having seen over the last five years, it's you know whether it's SAS or wherever they're using, they have it, and they even have people who understand it and know about it and things like that, the data tables, everything, but. Accessing it, knowing how to manipulate it, and then having people who know what to do once they've even made the insights, that seems to be where the forefront issues are, at least as, as I've seen it. And, and again, what I've seen with you, uh, what you just described, we're, we're beginning to see that all over the place now because they're just, everybody's collected everything, and it's like, that puts me more quickly the right stuff. And it's kind of intuitive because I've always been.
I mean, again, yeah. this is a, this is a simple example, but we we actually because we are just transitioning CEOs in our firm, and so we wanted to go through every document produced by our company in the last 20 years, and we had 30,000 documents. We came down to we really only need 300 that are really going to drive everything, and just it, it, part of it is what's important. And we have a group that manages storage and retention, you know, of our data, and uh, they have criteria that you have to be. One of the bigger challenges for us is um, just in images. I mean, CTs and MRIs, you know, it used to be a four-slice CT or a six-slice yeah. MRI or whatever. Yeah. Now it's you know, it's 10,000 slices of images. You know, storing 10, you know, 10,000 slices in one scan is, you know, that's a pretty significant. So there's a lot of work going on in healthcare on how to compression. You know, how do you compress that? How do you um, uncompress it when you need it? So a lot of interesting work that's happening in radiology especially um, and CV and others. And to the, to the data challenge, um, what we're hearing in our organizations that we work with, especially as we get into big data, now you guys probably are ones that pull data from wherever it is and do your analysis and do all that work, you. right? You know, you, you do everything yourselves. Um, we really need to kind of separate the data people from the analytics people because there's many, many more data people than there are analytics people. And with big data, I've got terabytes that are sitting out there somewhere. I've got to pull that data together. I've got to join tables. And I can't just pull it all out and shove it on a server underneath my desk anymore, like we used to do, right? So now we really need to work more and more closely with our IT or our data management people because they need to set up the data for us. We can't just pull it terabytes out and shove it under the desk anymore. We've got to work with IT to make sure that it's in a place where we can work with it and not pull it across a very small wire and you know bring down our IT systems. So I think that's another data challenge. Well, I think I'll maybe talk a positive thing that I've seen also, though, relative to this, is um, I've had the opportunity to teach in business schools over the last 20 years. And so even five or 10 years ago, teaching, I was teaching at, um, at Wharton. And you, know, you give someone a normal distribution at that time and they were like, wait a second, you know, what is this? And having recently taught at Dartmouth, the students, one of the good things I think you're seeing and you're gonna see over the next five to 10 years are MBAs who are the people who are driving the decisions that are controlling a lot of this are finally becoming very familiar and have a much better understanding of what's driving this. And so I think unfortunately, we're all the dog being wagged by the tail saying, okay, make all this happen by the, by the guys up who say it. But now that they're beginning to really understand the implications of what their strategic decisions are, I think a lot of what we're going to start to see is limitations of data but the stuff that's needed, descriptions of problems and analysis that are relevant to the business, and then the willingness to execute. So I don't think we're there yet, but what I see at the forefront, I, maybe, maybe education is not the forefront, but at least what I see within the educational environments are the standard student in an MBA program who is driving some of this has been massively improved. And I think that is gonna to start to help some of this as well. Yeah, I'll an example from my side. Um, we worked with a, a client over the, a year or so ago that was had a very massive amounts of data they were putting on it, you know, terabytes of data a day uh, on their operations. And it was, it was quite interesting. They had an internal team that was building a fairly sophisticated optimization model. And that model, they, they built it and tested it on a small set of data. When they finally ran it on the full set, nothing happened. It, it couldn't converge. They threw all the hardware they could at it. They, you know, put the best uh, computers they could they could buy it, at, on it, and you know, got to no answer at all. And you know, meanwhile, we had kind of been saying we got to simplify the way we're looking at the problem so that it's solvable here. And, and so I think that's a you know, certainly was a lesson learned through that process, and I think it's a common failure mode as well that comes with the, you know, the responsibility of having all the, all the data is knowing, knowing what's important and what's not important so you can make the right trade-offs and actually get to an answer in a reasonable time. And, and we heard Tom Davenport talk about Analytics 3.0, right, and external data, external to the organization and all the sensor data, and we heard about uh, social data, we heard Twitter and how much data they're collecting, and, and lots of external data to the organization and opportunities for data aggregators to come bring together, you know, insurance information and healthcare information and lots of new opportunities for data aggregators. So I don't think we do have all the data yet. I think that there's this next level of um, external data that needs to be brought in. Maybe we have our internal data under control.
control, but I'm not sure that we have the external data in the control yet. The, the hot area for us in, in that realm is uh, price growth. So, you know, now it's actually possible to know your competitors' prices if they're put on your website. So I see a lot more of, you know, before you're making pricing decisions in a vacuum, now you're actually trying to make them in the context of knowing your competitors' needs and it becomes a little bit more of a chess and, and product reviews and things like that online that you know <coughs> what people are saying about not only your company but your competitors' company, so bringing all that kind of competitive information into the mix. I was just going to go back to the internal data. There's a concern, there's a danger, I think, with big data and the fact that so much of it's so easy to get that sometimes people don't want to go after the stuff that's a little bit harder. They kind of avoid it. Maybe it goes to what you're saying, too. It's like, it's more work if I have to add some more data, or there's some data that's just harder to get. External data is harder to get. Yeah. Um, and people are not going after it. It's like, well, I've got all of this data that was really easy. Why, why do I need more? Exactly. Exactly. But the external data, you know, from our perspective, you know, we know what happens when we see a patient and we take care of them. Uh, but you know, we want to know what happens, you know, after they've left Mayo and they've gone home and they've had, you know, they've had lived their life for a while. So, you know, we see a lot more collaboration across the industry, from pharma to life sciences, device companies, insurance um, providers coming together to share their data to be able to answer some of the questions we can't answer on our own. And that's that's really an exciting piece that poses some really unique challenges. For how you bring that data together. Um, how do you make sure there's, you know, the privacy and the security issues are all handled appropriately? But um, you know, there's there's so much data out there that we still need to get at. How many of you have Fitbits? You know, there's a lot of, you know, all this new data coming in from all these sources around health and wellness and what people are doing to you know, have a healthy lifestyle that leads to lower utilization and better health for people. So but again, lots of opportunities that will evolve over time. I have a prediction. This is, this takes the the uh, MIT geek at it well, in me and. Uh, what way I think about this, but I think you're gonna see a trade-off curve developed over the next five years where people are gonna talk about getting good data, there's an expense associated with it from interpreting it, figuring out how you wanna collect it. And so every piece of data that you collect or every piece of, of decision-making that you want costs you a certain amount. And presumably, if you've, gone again, if you've gone after the right data first, the first piece of information you get is gonna have the most value. The next piece after that is gonna have marginally less, and so on and so on as you go down. And as you go further and further into the data collection process, each extra piece of data is going to, should have marginally less value until you come up with a point where the value of collecting it is less than the value gained. Now, each field will probably have a different curve, whereas in the, in the healthcare profession, one might have one that says it's really worth collecting a lot. Whereas, I mean, I've seen some businesses that are so incredibly simple in terms of what they're doing that the amount that they're spending on trying to get their data right is so irrelevant for what they're actually trying to decide that they're going to be taking, they're going to be backing off of it. And I think the <coughs> academics are going to glom onto this sometime in the next five years where they start getting people to ask the question in the same way that you did supply and demand curves and basic economics. How do you start to think about what's the break-even point where it's no longer worth collecting data, but I'm going to go out and just make a decision? And I think that's where you're going to start to see all of this ultimately go. Because you start to you like, I don't even think they know how to deal with the data they have now, and I don't even see them getting a lot of the value out of it. The fact that they're talking, you'd say, two and three levels beyond, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's like, good luck to them doing something with it. But I think that's what you're going to see, is starting to understand the trade-offs between what's the cost of this data and what's the benefit of it. And again, depending on if the healthcare field, I can see them going much further deeper into it. Whereas a lot of the areas I've worked in, you know, I kind of joke, do you really care whether they're making right turns every single time or, you know, maybe they do. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Yeah. I got a question here. Um, I, I guess we're, we're assuming the organization is ready. We're, we're just taking decisions about the data. But I'm wondering if, you, if I can collect some of your thoughts about what happens when the organization is not ready? So we, we get these great ideas at the, at the data analyst level, but, 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 but the senior management did, did not believe it. So can, can you share about you know, any ideas how we can actually break that barrier of showing proof of value, or how, how you guys address those probably at the beginning of your organizations and, and that kind of stuff? So what a good straight man. That was our switch over to uh, kind of selling the value of analytics within your organization. So what happens if 
Um, you do all this analysis and you spend all this money in collecting data and doing the analysis and your results come up with the exact same thing that the executive said. I would have made that decision if I had just used gut feel. Or the corollary, you do all the analysis and it comes out with something that's totally um, not intuitive and against <coughs> gut feel. So what are your experiences with kind of selling analytics into the organizations that you're working with and, and how that story goes to sell that when you have results that match and results that don't? So I, think, I guess from, from my side, I think we're so fortunate to live in a, in a period of time when analytics has never been sexy. And you know, we, it, it sells itself. And so I, I actually find it's very infrequently the case that I have to explain why analytics are gonna be helpful. Uh, you must live in a very different world. <laughs> higher, higher. So, so I would say my experience is diametrically opposed to that. Um, even with the highest level of credibility, I find that, um, and no matter what level of the organization we're trying to work with, whether it's the guys out on the factory floor or out in an airport or whatever, there I find immense skepticism. But I think what uh, this gets back to the question that I asked David earlier about the different personality types. We will typically go in one guy who's the I'm going to impress you with the technology, but then there is always somebody that incrementally is trying to give them just enough to give them the comfort. And if you hit them with everything all at once, nobody's ready for it. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a process of credibility establishment where it's a, I mean, sometimes we'll take on something that is so incredibly simple, but simply show them that we can either, and, and we get an improvement on one dimension first. So if the first dimension is we can do the same thing, but we can just do it faster, that may be one element of getting credibility. The second might be, we, you can do it with two variables, we can do it with three variables now. But if they're doing it at a pace of, you know, it takes them uh, you know, four days, and you come in and you do it in one second, and you go from three variables to 400, and you do it across, I mean, they're just not ready to accept that. And quite frankly, think of yourselves. If someone says, I'm gonna remake your image, and by the way, I'm gonna completely change your hair, your clothes, your weight, your, your you know, you're like, wait a second, no, no, just, just tell me how to put on different you know, shoes, right? That, that, I mean, I'm kind of I'm being sarcastic about it, but that's kind of the approach. It's an incremental approach where you, you just move them incrementally past their comfort zone one step at a time until you establish the credibility. But I, I, don't, I, I don't mean to you know, go up against you, but I, I see that it is still a big challenge. And, and I would say, just to follow up, I, I think it depends on the type of problem that you're dealing with, right? And so we tend to do a lot of work in strategic type of decisions where there's, I find quite often a thirst for, you know, we don't, we're trying to make this decision about should we, should we or should we not enter this market and we don't know enough about what the alternatives are and what the decision space looks like. We all think you're very fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're physician led and fortunately most of our physicians have uh, quite a bit of their, their part of their time also doing research. So they're very science and data driven in their research domain. So they bring a natural affinity to want to have good data and evidence when they make decisions, that helps us a lot. The biggest issue we face is um, cycle time on some of our analytics. I mean, the practice of medicine is moving so quickly right now and changing so fast that we're sometimes struggling to keep up with the, the need for evidence and data and analytics and some of the questions being asked. So it's, it's not moving fast enough to keep up with some of the, the speed of change in healthcare. Hi, uh, Brian, I could Google. I had a question. Um, I guess more for the consultants sub there, but it probably applies as well to Mayo to some extent. As analytics becomes so popularized, do you find, I imagine you find yourself with much more demand, much more uh, companies flooding to you saying you need help, but I'm wondering whether it makes it hard for you to sit through and actually explain that your value proposition isn't IT or isn't uh, visualization only or isn't database, uh, or whether you're finding it's kind of more the same old thing that you've been doing and, uh, and that's just sort of background noise. So I guess from my side, uh, what I've seen is a lot more companies stepping forward that, you know, I have this analogy that I use in my mind, of, you know, first you learn to crawl, then you learn to walk, then you learn to run, then you, then you think about you know, entering the Olympics, right? And there's, I, I, we tend to work or have a lot of companies coming forward to us that are just, just starting to crawl, just starting to walk, and you know, wanna 
dip their toe in a little bit and, and get some exposure to using analytics. I think there's, if I look across the spectrum of businesses out there, there's a huge percentage of businesses that really have done nothing and want to start moving in, in that direction. And so, you know, I think that I, I see a lot of uptick in, in, in all the areas, but I think in that area in particular, that there's just more interest to try it out than there maybe had been a few years ago. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I wonder if that drives the same kind of consulting that you would do at a company that's more mature. So somebody comes in there not ready to crawl yet, and you know, is it is it really your sweet spot to help them learn to crawl, or are you doing stuff that's much more advanced and deep, and actually that helping them to crawl takes you away from another client who's ready for the Olympics? Because it'd be much more interesting work for you, right? So I'm just curious whether you're having to spend a lot of energy sifting the ones who want to crawl from the ones who want to enter the Olympics, or whether you do both of those, or, or whether, you know, if that's an issue, if that's coming up as an issue. So we, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, we certainly do both of those, and, and I think there is a, uh, you know, you can add a lot to the to the company that wants to crawl. It doesn't, you know, if it's something where I know it's out of our sweet spot, then I'll, then, you know, I'll say no. But if it's something that, you know, they want to move and take a step in the direction, then I view it as, you know, building a long-term relationship where someday they're going to be running and, you know, they're going to, we're, we're going to have established that and put them on the course that's going to lead to a lot of success. There's a lot of value in the team. So, so I, I think in our case, um, we, we've established a, uh, a reputation of arrogance, which helps us drive the right type of clients to us. Um, we actually literally will go in and say, look, if you think you can find someone else who can solve this, we're probably not the right firm. So in terms of the, uh, no, but, but, but that's serious, because we, we, we try to drive away what you might consider to be the lower level problems. But what is a slightly different issue is even at the higher level, when we get them thinking they want to solve the harder problems, the more difficult problems, I mean, it's part of the reason why we hire the type of people we do, is they, they, they can't distinguish between us and what might be a mediocre solution. So we, I mean, the type of people that we try to hire, and probably similar to the type of people I know that you probably try to hire, are very far and few between. And we'll go into a situation where they're trying to solve something that I can tell you is almost PhD level research in terms of difficulty. And they'll say, yeah, well, I've got this firm, they've got 4,000 data scientists that are experts in this and we're gonna to go to them because they cost a third of the price. It's like, that's what, being able to, to distinguish what's really at the high level. So to answer your question, I find it pretty easy to shed off the people who don't really wanna do the Olympic level stuff because it just doesn't fall into our um, sort of uh, sweet spot. What I find more difficult though is trying to, without, coming through reference, which then there's no problem, but if someone cold comes to us with a problem, they very often, even if they have an Olympic level problem, don't understand how hard that Olympic level problem is to solve. On the other hand, SAS will help anyone. So no matter whether you're at the BI level or the predictive analytics or the prescriptive analytics, we'll work with you. So don't you worry about that. We come into lots of customer engagements where people just are at their reporting schedule, at you know, that, that reporting step. So. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> Does anybody want to talk about, uh, <laughs> we are not elitists, so we will work with anyone. <laughs> um, does anybody want to talk about any failures and, and problems that they've come into where, you know, it, a project has gone bad and what the symptoms of that project going bad might have been, not naming anybody. <laughs> None of you had any bad projects, I can tell. <laughs> I was just going to answer the last question just briefly. I mean, we, we see a lot of growth in predictive analytics in healthcare, both in Mayo and other organizations that we haven't seen in the past. So a lot of uh, disease progression modeling and readmission modeling and you know, all sorts of things like that, um, as well as both hypothesis-driven, hypothesis but also graph analytics for non-hypothesis-driven with supercomputers. So a lot of growth in that space, which is great. The other is yield management, kind of yield management analytics that we haven't seen as much in healthcare that we're seeing a lot more of. To, Again, utilize capacity, you know, as well as we can, both surgical suite, physician capacity, and other capacity. So I'll come back to the failure, Kathy. Okay. Yeah. I'll just pick up on what you just said, Mark. Um, you, you used the term modeling uh, just now, and um, so when we think about the analytics piece of big data, and a lot of people's minds is sort of statistical analysis, data mining, signal detection, things like that. But there are other So, so there are much more 
in short supply. You're, I mean, you can answer that question a lot better than I can, probably, so you should well, talk about that. Market, but you know the market. Yeah, you're the healthcare. In all markets, in all markets, the analytical talent is in short supply. Um, the McKinsey's uh, study said that there's going to be, you know, a 60% gap in um, supply versus demand by 2018. So. Um, there's lots of programs going on to build our analytical talent from a university perspective and grow and not just steal people from other uh, organizations, but also to help extend analytical talent down to the right kinds of people in an organization. So talking about kind of the data piece, there's a lot more data people. So why are the analytical people pulling data and doing joins and all those tables? Why are they doing their reporting? Why are they doing all of that stuff when their value is in some of the more sophisticated analytics and kind of working with the business people to turn the, the problem into some mathematical representation of it. So those are the kinds of things that we have to think about in our organization of how we transform our organization to deal with that gap in talent. Maybe a really weird question, but um, I've read that same study where there, there's a, a gap in need for analytics are you seeing any imposter analytics out there? I mean, people who talk a good game, that, uh, is that a risk going forward into the industry? And that, uh, you want me to stop? I'll, <laughs> no, I'll give you, I, I, I think, and again, I'll probably, I'm really here to insult people, so I'm gonna do this, but I think the worst disaster in our field, honestly, was I2. I mean, I think if people know the I2 story, and I, and I met the guys when they were starting it out, and they basically said, look, if we can sell it, don't worry, we're gonna get it out there. And, when, and I, and I do, I think I would put them out there as imposter analytics, but they, they created a sexy product, they got it out in the marketplace, it did some very good things, but they sold it as something it wasn't, and when it didn't deliver, you ended up in a, it, it basically tarnished the whole field. And so I'm, I'm, I'm using them prototypically, but to your point, yes, absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's an example of it, but you see more of that across the board. Yeah, I would, I would add, the, the other area that I see a lot of and I wouldn't say it's necessarily intentional and impostering, but um, this whole area of visualization. There's a lot of uh, tools out there, and it's so easy to make a nice picture now that um, you know you can easily be fooled, you know, whether, like I said, intentionally or not, that it's got to be the right answer because it's, it looks really good. And and I think that's and, you know if you talk about common failure modes, that's certainly something that it's, I see as a real pitfall. Uh, whether it's us or somebody else doing the work, that you gotta make sure you're doing the right analysis and don't just take a pretty picture. And making the right interpretation, right? So, so that's, you know, you can't go like that. People can look at data and they can discover things in, in visual um, areas. And, and actually, I mean, one of the things that we wanna do is get more people looking at data to find insights and discover insights, but then don't have them necessarily try to go ahead and do you know, the heavy analytics, right? They, they should take those potential insights and bring them to someone who knows how to do some deeper analysis. So, so going back to your question about failure, look, no one, if you haven't failed, you haven't tried, right? There you go. But, um, and I remember when I was doing my PhD, I was sponsored by the board of, of Johnson & Johnson to do a project for my PhD research. And my, my PhD sponsorship cost over $100,000, and I remember them saying at Johnson & Johnson, no project ever fails if it costs over hundred thousand dollars. And I was like, that's a pretty interesting perspective. But the but the truth is, it really depends on how you define failure. Okay, so have we had projects that we've done the work, shown the result, they have been implemented? Absolutely. Have we had projects where we've tried to discover a relationship and couldn't? Absolutely. But I think the bigger I wouldn't call it whether it's failure or not, but I think the bigger challenge is actually to just to figure out, again, I go to this balance equation, but what's the balance between engineering and moving on? And what I mean by that is, so we're, again, we're involved in a project right now. It has a lack of data, but they need to get an answer. And so the engineering side of the firm wants to make sure that we have every single piece of data lined up. But you know what? At what point does really lining everything up and making sure that it's absolutely perfect less or more important than the fact that if we don't ever move, then we're actually going to get nothing done. And so rather than talk about success or failure, because you could just say if we never got the data, we were a failure, I think understanding to what degree, what makes a good answer 
I don't think is a very clearly understood, I, I wouldn't even call it a science, it's an art. And I, I, one of the um, informed slogans was the art of science or whatever it is, is understanding how to get that balance between art and science because to the scientist using art is a failure, right? And to the artist using the science is a failure. And understanding where you get that balance I think is a more, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the question, but a more appropriate, a, a possible different viewpoint to think about the issue as opposed to failure or not failure, but where, but how do you define what success actually is and how do you balance between those two? So I can tell you're a good salesman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, like, I just echo a comment or two just about, you know, um, you know we, we see failure more in not so much analytics, but in the ability to drive analytics into those kind of outcomes or changes that the analytics show the insights to do. And so I, I think, you know, my advice and what we've learned is we've got to put a lot of discipline into project management to make sure the right um, leadership's on board, the right proponents, the right um, practice engagement is there, so any insights that come out really can drive into practice appropriately with that strong leadership engagement. Um, so, you know, clean scope, those kinds of things, change management, so a lot of work has to be done. And that, I, I would argue the analytics team is not complete unless you have some way to take it through to the outcome, to the analytics team. I mean, you can't just hand it over the fence when you find it, it just never will work that way, it doesn't work well for us. You've got to somehow build the connections to the implementers or the fusionists or the, whoever that is to get those insights driven into outcomes. So I'll, I'll share a failure idea as well. Um, so, and I think this ties back a little bit to our discussion about data. Um, I, I think a, a common failure mode is kind of listening to the data that you have and ignoring the other side of the story because you don't have data. I don't know if that makes sense, but for example, we've done a lot of work in the area of product variety management and helping companies to decide should they by what paradigm should they make decisions about whether or not to add new products into their product lines? And what we see time and again is there's a real strong story from the marketing side or you know, the product development side that says, here's, here's my new product idea and I'm confident I can sell a thousand of these and therefore I'm gonna make this many dollars in revenue from the thousand. And you know, maybe they've taken it to the next step and said, well, some of that's gonna be cannibalizing something else, so I will I'll subtract that off. But most often, or more often than not, because that, the easy part to quantify, and they've, and they've gone out and made that measurement, there's no, there's no comparison on the other side of the scale to, well, what's the cost of adding the extra complexity? In? And so if I'm gonna have a new, if I'm gonna have a new variant of one of my products, do I have now to procure a new piece of tooling for that? Do I have you know, an additional inventory cost because now I'm spreading my inventory across lots of different variants instead of a smaller one? And so that, that to me is an example of where because I have information on one side and not on the other, I make the wrong decision. I think that's it, especially as data becomes more and more pervasive, it's easy to, to make the decision based on the data, ignore the whole story. So let's change gears a little bit to a little bit more controversial topic, as at least I've not been controversial enough. Um, in organizations that you work with or within your own organization, if you have some kind of um, centralized, three or four people, a group of, of analytics people, where should they report to? Should they report up to a business? Should they report up to IT? What's been the most successful and what have you seen in, in the practice of working with, with your clients or even internal to your organization? We can turn off the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the taping of it. <laughs> so um, we're, we're pretty decentralized now with analytics. Again, like I said, I've got several big groups that do it, but we've got a planning analytics team. We've got a marketing analytics team, we've got a um, laboratory analytics team, we've got some of our for-profit entities have their own analytics, whether it's our websites or our, you know, our, our information um, activities. So we've got a lot of different people doing analytics and it's pretty distributed right now. So there are some activity, there's some movement to bring some of those together, but it's gonna be slow going and I think very incremental, not, not some big revolution for us. But that causes challenges as, you know, as, as we um, try to work together on and, and maybe overlap on certain projects or duplicative in some areas. Um, from my standpoint, you know, we report up to our CAO most of our activities, that's who I oversee, which I think is the right place to our Chief Administrative Officer and um, have never kind of been in that IT state. I, think that I don't personally think that that's the right space for analytics to report in the IT domain. I've heard a lot of folks say that. Do you guys have any other thoughts on that? Groups that you've worked with? 
most of my clients bring us in on from the business side, right? Meaning the IT side. I think we probably have, we were talking earlier had a similar thought on that. And so oftentimes it's been because of some dissatisfaction or with what IT has to offer on the engineering side. So I personally think IT departments are making great strides and becoming more business savvy. But that's from at least been our experience of you know the analytics should start with the person asking asking the question. I feel about as unqualified to answer this question as you can be. I, I think I know very little about organizational structure, but um, what I've observed uh, is that I, I noticed that Ford had a policy that it would never let a plant manager stay in one place for more than three years, and it would always switch them around because in some sense they would become stagnant. And I think the most successful organizations that I've seen have tried to, in some ways, just switch it up how they switch it up and whether they've been successful, I, I can't say, I, I just don't know the secret sauce to it, but I find that the organizations that are the least effective are the ones that do try to cement in a way of doing it and then stick with that. That somehow both switching the people, switching the reporting structure, sometimes where they divide it functionally, but then they usually switch it the other way. But just moving it around, that fluidity tends to prevent things from stagnating in a way that prevents uh, progress. So that's. Again, I, and I'm the least um, qualified to answer the question, but that's just a casual observation. And as a follow-up, Chris, to your uh, comment, um, we would typically think from an analytics perspective that someone is coming with a business problem and then we do all our due diligence about what data do we have and exploring the data and formulating the problem and that kind of thing. Um, with this era of big data, um, that paradigm is shifting a little, and I'm wondering if any of you are seeing that, that people are just having access to the data and they're not, they don't have a question in mind. They're just interrogating the data to see what interesting things they can find. More of a discovery process, no questions, but kind of what they find from a discovery and patterns in the data is leading to new questions. And so, you know, that's not a, a, a traditional thing that, that we think about from an analytics perspective, but I think it is changing the way um, organizations are looking at problems and finding problems and identifying new opportunities. We've had a few clients that actually have data science teams and, and I think it's been interesting that in those examples, and I'd be curious if it's true more broadly or not, but in, in those examples the data science team is actually part of the business uh, side of the business rather than that. But it really starts to blur the line as you've got someone that's you know, a true data professional but they're not residing in Anybody seeing that out in their organization? Good. I mean, a good example was probably talked before over there when Scott Lowe presented, um, where um, clearly, as one example, how that playing with the data, that interrogating the data, is becoming much more of an intuitive visual thing now. So, uh, I mean, we see all sorts of that too that, that can start to, to use and just play around with the data and see what they can what they can see in it. So so that exploratory part is I think becoming a very interesting component in that. So yeah we'll we'll ask to see that. And that that's I think it's really important. Yeah, I think we're about to open up to the big Doesn't SAS call this torturing the data until it confesses? <laughs> <laughs> well I think the industry might say that. <laughs> all right, I think we are out of time. I want to thank all our panelists uh, again for their thoughts and opinions and they're, you know, kind of sparring one another there. And thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it.